see the benefits um, of mate choice and polyandry in the cricket versus um, um, Liverpoolianos. Um, to start off, like the speaker had two talks before. I'll talk about, uh, as you know from the animal kingdom, most species have strong male-male competition with um, males competing for the access to females. There we go. With males competing for the access um, for females, and you see in the lower left corner, like for instance, the stag beetle, which is just like, um, throw other beetles away, or in the elephant and seal, the males compete for females. But then you also have strong sexual selection in males, which then selects for very strong and colorful displays um, that females get attracted to, like in the um, peacock spider or the bird of paradise or the green. Um, Another lizard. And in these species, it's also females who invest in the offspring. Males usually don't invest at all in their offspring or just very little. And females contribute big oocytes or invest also in parental care. However, the system that I'll be talking about today is different. Um, the examples that you see on this slide um, show males that invest heavily in their offspring. And sometimes so much so that sex roles get reversed and females start competing for males. Like for instance, in the um, honey locust beetle down here where females compete with one another for access to males. Or in the jacana where females even have um, weapons to compete against other females. These investment in males can come in different ways. Like for instance, in the giant water bug up here, the male takes care of the offspring and carries around the eggs. Or in the plains wanderer down here, where the male will also take care of the eggs. And you can also see that um, role reversal has taken place in this species, that females are way more ornamented than males. So strong sexual selection females. Then there's another type of investment, which is um, copulatory or pre copulatory investment with, um, we call it sometimes nuptial gifts or gift giving. And this is something we can find again in the honey locust beetle and also in the um, bush crickets that I'm talking about today. And the interesting thing is that the gift that is given to the female sometimes can be as much as 30% of the body weight of the male. So the project I'm gonna talk about today is a collaboration with these people, with Brian, who's now at Vanderbilt University, and Steve and Klaus, who are at um, the University of Fife, Bielefeld and Jonathan, who is also now at the University of Idaho. So what I want to do with you is take you on a little excursion to the field side of this key experiment. So we're leaving Providence and we're slowly flying over to Greece to a small little village called Palio Castro, which has only, I think, 20 inhabitants, just very few people. And we were basically camping there for one month to look at the benefits of mate choice and polyandry in this gift-giving species. Um, this species is endemic to Greece. Mm -hmm. And you can see the distribution on this map, and we basically had our station right in the middle of the distribution of this species. They live in higher lands, so we were up in the mountains at, at about 1,500 meters altitude, and we're going out at night to collect these crickets. And what do they look like? So here's a picture of the species, and you can see there's two different color morphs. There's green ones and black ones um, that are equally abundant. And females do have this, this is a bit awkward, I'll show it to you. They have this sword-like um, oviposita, and that's how you can tell them apart. Males do have these little hooks with which they, which they use for mating and hooking onto the female, and then they grasp the female and transfer this to the mother's wall. They also have these rudimentary wings that they use to sing to the females and attract the females, and females will then move towards the male. And what you can see in the lower right corner is basically almost the finishing of one mating where the male transferred a huge spermatophore to the female. And to make it a bit more illustrative, I brought another video. Hope it's 
mating so there you go so this is a very related species and the mating basically looks similar to the proecilimon mating so here you see the little hooks that hook onto the female and then he transfers her synapoi which in which um has the sperm inside, and then he presses out a huge amount of spermatophyllax, which is about 30% of his body weight. And I like to make a very nice comparison, which makes it a bit more vivid in your head. It's basically, if you take an 80 kilogram male, and this human male, of course, and if that male was to mate with a female, and would transfer about 25% of his body weight, he would weigh 60 kilograms afterwards. So if he wanted to go on a diet, that would be the best way to <laughs> And what you see at the end of the mating of the pick is the female basically just enjoys the nuptial gift right away and will feed off it. And so much so that she stops feeding on any leaflet after 12 hours or longer time periods, depending on the species. So now that we know the species, we will go right into the experiment. So what we were interested in, as I said in the beginning, is to disentangle the benefits of polyandry and mate choice. And usually they are inherently combined in one system. So we designed an experiment where we hoped that we could tell apart um, the benefits of these two parameters. So we did a two-factorial design. One factor was um, polygamy or polyandry. So some females were kept with several males and other females were just um, kept with only one male at a time or just allowed to mate with one male at a time, I should say. And then we split these, this treatment into another treatment by choice. So we had a treatment that was called polyandry with mate choice. And the female that was in a polyandrous treatment was exposed at each mating to three males, but they were three different males. And what I should say, we repeated this mating three times in a row and we um, had a space of two days where there was no matings in between. So basically how the experiment looked like was on day one, the female was allowed to mate. On day two and three, there was a rest phase so that males could um, replenish their ejaculates and females could lay the eggs. On day four, they would mate again, then two rest days again, and on day seven, day seven they would mate yet again. The other treatment with no mate choice, so the female just got assigned three different males on these three different mating days. And in the monandrous treatment, the female that was allowed to exert mate choice was presented with three males at an initial mating, and then we could determine with which, with which male she mated with because he lost a lot of weight by transferring these somatophore, and then she was presented at consecutive mating with only that one male. And without mate choice, we just chose one random male and she had to mate with that male throughout. And what we expected was something like this. So these are just hypothetical scenarios. So if polyandry was beneficial to the female in the short run, then we would expect an increase in fecundity in comparison to the monandry treatment, but also um, mate choice has a smaller benefit, for instance, than poly polyandry has, but we would still see an increase in fecundity in a mate choice treatment. And similarly, if you just like change the hypothesis, but here mate choice has a bigger benefit than polyandry has, so you will see a stronger fecundity spike in the monandry mate choice treatment than in a no choice treatment. So where we did that was, as I told you, in Greece, and of course you already came on the tour with me, so I will show you the nice parts of Greece as well before going right into the results. And what we did was basically camping out in front of a little school that was um, abandoned because the village was very small and we just collected these crickets and kept them in cups inside the school for our experiment. Let's get to the results. So what we found first, we looked at um, whether the number of matings changed or was different in treatment comparisons. And we did a two-way ANOVA with these two factors, polyandry and mate choice, and we basically found no difference. So females in the polyandrous treatment mated as often as females in the monandrous um, treatment. And these are means with standard errors. So you see that there is basically nothing going on. You could argue, okay, there is a trend in the monandrous treatment, but we had quite a big sample size of um, 30 replicates per treatment. And I don't think that if we increased sample size, you would necessarily find anything. 
But then when we look at the quantity, which we measured as egg number, we found a completely different result than to what we actually expected. And what we see is that females, disregarding the polyandrous treatment, produced more eggs when they were in a no-choice scenario. And we found that at first a bit baffling because we tried to design the experiment so that we could tease apart these things. However, if you look back at the treatments, you see something quite obvious. And if you look at this no choice scenario and this uh, this mate choice scenario and this mate choice scenario, females were initially exposed to three males at the same time, whereas in a, a no choice scenario they weren't. And we think that there might be something going on, like either food competition with males or still male harassment, even though the male transfers the seed to the madrepore. But it's hard to say. It would just be an artifact of the experimental design, and we would have to basically redo it thinking about how to increase or decrease um, stress levels for females in these scenarios. Because if you take them in the wild, males usually are located on different spots on a bush, and the female can then slowly move towards the male that she prefers. So there is no real male-male competition going on. So I kind of would like to exclude that possibility. Whereas if you go to the lab or to the experiment how we performed it, the female is in a smaller space together with three males, so it's not quite clear what happened there. It could be food competition, even though we provided them with harmful food sources. But it's interesting that it looks Okay, and I'm almost out of time. Just one little thing. This is something I'm going to do now at the University of Idaho, some experimental evolution with Nosograntias, because I'm inherently interested in sexual selection of females. And we are looking in how the genome changes due to strong sexual selection in females compared to males. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, so I'm wondering what density is there about that in nature? Because I'm thinking about the female that comes across with one male, and if it's weird to come across only one male and not more, maybe like, oh, maybe I should get all my eggs right now. Yeah, right. Yeah, it does, does make sense, but she kind of came across several males in several days, but in each day she only had access to one male. And I think it is rather artificial, because when you go out in the field, you hear several crickets singing at the same time, but then she does not have the time to move to every of these single females, which is really rather slow. So, yeah, I'm not sure if she could access several males and listen to them in both worlds. I'm just thinking about sort of like a perceived male like availability thing. No, I think that's a, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Um, although the number of eggs is different in these scenarios, is there a difference in how many of these eggs have been taken? Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, I would have liked to do that, but the, the eggs don't do very well in the lab, so I have no idea. Does the male spermatophore uh, change over you know, sequential matings with the same female? Um, if he has access to food, it doesn't. Oh. Because I 